Okay. Yo, and we are back with my boy, Jordan Palachikia. What the fuck you saying, doggy? Fuck. Sometimes I come in there and I just say fuck. Okay, so we did a comedy show. <laughs> we just did one. You going right in, huh? Yeah, man. You're so impressive. I appreciate it, homie. Your fans need to know. Your fans ever ask you, like, uh, hey, you got any more stand-up shit or anything? Like, Yeah, actually, I get DMs. When are you coming to Michigan? I'm like, yeah, the border is closed, fam. Yeah. Canadian, dude. Yeah, the border is closed. COVID. <laughs> yeah, you know. You uh, you need some more fucking. That's what my camera. I got the camera off a of, of fucking boat. What? Sorry. That's why I got the camera. Start filming fucking sets. You're one of those guys who just I you pick shit. up you pick up on a on a, a hobby or any interest, and you're balls deep within like yeah. three days, seventy two hours. You're all in. Yeah, I go uh, like I'm. Uh, I try not to be too much with it, like in the open. Yeah, like I know some guys, like Joey Harlem, hilariously will fucking have a moving company after moving two people. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Like, Did, is that actually a thing? He's a guy that makes companies. Like, he'll be like, "Yeah, yeah, no, we, I'm fucking, I'm a caterer now." He like, oh, I thought he was just like an employee. I didn't realize it was his own business. He'll do that with everything. Oh shit! But it's See, smart. I appreciate. I respect that. That entrepreneurial spirit. For me, that just is too much spotlight. It's too much fucking spotlight on me there. So I, As, I try to dabble. You're deep into photography right now. You said twenty six hundred for that camera. That 26. blows my mind because I used to think. DSLRs are um, cheap. Yeah, are cheap. Yeah, I know. I, I used know. to think DSLRs are what's expensive, and that's like, that's one of those like small base cameras, right? Well, that, might as well. That thing. Oh, you want to grab it? Okay, might so yeah, well. grab it here. Let's take a look. Yeah, so this is. Uh, this thing's. We're just like minutes. talking about it. It's like three feet. Well, away I love. I just love tech, man. I can't help myself. Like uh, when phones were a thing, when phones were coming out, like oh. when phones were hot. Yeah, like, you know, in the beginning, when the next phone, you're like, you know the specs, you're oh, excited shit. for it. And the, back then, it was like, those were major leaps. When, when the iPhone 3, 4, Huge 5, oh steps. You're right. Up. Now it's just like, let's just, yeah. how are we going to upgrade this camera for the next year's release? That's really kind of what it is, isn't it? Just yeah. a more aggressive camera every year. Yeah, it's like a new housing. They're like, okay, we're going to put it in this this time, or glass, or like whatever. Yeah, they go curved edges, and yeah. then square edges, and then they go back to curved edges, Fuck. and then they go back to square edges, and they give it glass, they give it aluminum. They just keep going back and forth to change it from last year's model. But remember when you were like, uh, oh, maybe the new phone will have more screen. Oh, yeah. Dude, we've, <laughs> we've already hit we're the passing. limit of screen, yeah. and we're like sizing back down to the optimal point almost. Yeah, have you actually looked into the 12 Pro, the iPhone? My girlfriend has it. What, what, what's what's the sell on this one? Uh, the sell right now is... I'm assuming if, camera, right? The camera's sick. The phone's just... It's like an iPad Pro in a, a 12. An iPad Pro it feels like the, It feels like... Remember the old iPhone 5? It feels yeah, like I that, love but, the iPhone 5. It feels like that, but bigger. How big is it? Like a. It's the same size as the iPhone 11 6.1. So it's bigger than this 10 I have. Just a little bit, but it doesn't feel bigger than that. And it's got probably. The, the last year's one had three big circles for cameras. This one probably has four, right? No, no. This one has three, but it has like a LiDAR sensor. So right here, it's got like a LiDAR sensor. What is that? It's. Ah, oh, fuck. I'm not too. Uh, I'm not LiDAR. Oh, LiDAR. That's. They were talking about using that to like figure out where like oil is underground. It like does <laughs> something to the dimension, so it's able to like graft three and two dimensions. Oh, I think so it's that shit that lets you put a dinosaur in a picture that's not there. Oh, and like the dinosaur <laughs> so. will have sh sh uh, shadows behind it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So it gives actually uh, depth pers perspective. Yeah. Oh, interesting. What's at case? So if you think about phones, so every. People get mad at Apple, but like I, I'm not. I like Apple, but I'm not like. Oh my God, you have to use it. Yeah. But anything you see in a phone, so they did the wide angle last year, and what's interesting about sensors of a phone, the new one has a bigger sensor in the wide angle lens. In the, in the newest phone. In the newest Pro Max. So the Pro Max is actually different than the Pro. Huh. And they're they're just trying to figure I'm out. I'm just so confused at what they they offer every device now in three or four are, are uh, alternatives, like versions of it. And it's just like, what's even going on anymore? I, I like the price, the the base level price point for the cheapest one is already like, 
at the market high spectrum of prices, you know? Do you know what I think they do is they look at a family. They look at like a white family in San Francisco yeah. and they're like, what, what are their needs? <laughs> what can we give the kid, the mom and the dad that's all the same but different? You're right. That's so fun, and that and that is the uh, the the bar they're trying to like yeah. the San Francisco tech family, yeah. which is not at all representative of, of North who, America or who uses it. It's like <laughs> when you go to Aldo or you go to a fucking shoe store. Steve Madden has men and women's shoes. So when the wife and the husband get men and women's, it's like we have Steve Madden's, but they're different. So they can show it off. If you all have the same iPhone, they don't have to show their friends. Like so much appeal, even just with the camera, like see how excited we are to talk about it? So much of the appeal is like, I got the new iPhone. I got the new, so It's even, a conversation. Yeah, so if you're like, I have a pro, an iPhone 12 Pro, you're like, oh, do you have the mini? Let me see the mini. The mini is the same phone, smaller, but I wanna see it. Just to see it, yeah, I just exactly. Hold just because, yeah, I see. That's why I'm asking about it. Because even though I don't give a fuck about the 12 Pro, I kind of give a fuck about it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I kind of like. Have you seen it? You know, is it what's good about it? You know, I just lost track. Probably around the 10, 11. I don't know what it is. And I, are they gonna go? Is there gonna be an iPhone 13? I'm always wondering when they're gonna just rebrand it. When are they gonna just start afresh? They're, and they're with a new name called it. iPhone XI. Like, go Roman numer numerals at this point or something. Well, we can't be 14, 15. The next one might not have a charging port. It'll just be wireless? It'll just be a fucking thin piece. Ah. Beautiful, beautiful piece of hardware. They already went with the proprietary fucking uh, input for charging on this one. Yeah. And now they're quick to just be like fuck charging altogether wireless or nothing it's like okay none of us have that in our cars so we have to get your thing just for the home like but even uh, notice this phone see this little cube you're using yeah notice how long it takes to charge your phone uh yeah because it's not one of those like super well it's just like ones. a 15 watt cube it's like they do this shit where it's a really highly engineered product. Yeah. But the manufacturing around it, like the delivery or like the service. Like if I was to sell you our comedy, I wouldn't be like, okay, a boss, he's hilarious. And then the acts around him aren't that good. Like the whole package, if we were trying to sell a package, it's kind of what Apple gives you. It's like the phone's sick. But like the things to make it good for you, we're not going to give you off the bat. Yeah, because it's not cost effective. Kind like, of, I guess. I don't, like, you don't know. I don't know. They keep making decisions that are clearly like, first of all, every time you update your iPhone, it slows down. They say, oh, we're optimizing it for, for performance. And that's why your battery's garbage now and it's super slow. It's like, no, that's just your way of being like, hey, time for a new phone. You know? If you, I don't know if you remember having all, like the six, I had the six before, man. Every time I got an update, it'd just be like slaggier and laggier. And I actually got caught for that. Actually, got there wasn't there a lawsuit where they got like there's a there is sued a for like so you wanna, tampering with battery know, life. Do you want to know a little? It's not necessarily tampering with battery life so much as it is a choice on the what to prioritize. What to prioritize to make the phone feel as though it can do like there's there's two sides to the coin. If you've used Android phones, if you used iPhones, like at some point it deteriorates in a way, but you're like, the phone itself doesn't actually deteriorate. It's more of what the app is. So if a new phone comes out and it has like eight gigs of RAM. So for example. Is that what the 12 Pro has, eight gigs? I don't think so, because okay. Apple, Apple fucks with the numbers to use less and get more out of it. Which is how, you, that's just good engineering. Yes and no, it's also a factor of like, they're turning off certain things. It's like, you can run really fast if I don't make you run for two kilometers. Gotcha. It's like of only measuring you from like the takeoff. It's like awesome. But they do the same thing with computers. But yeah, exactly. But it's like, don't let me run really fast then. Pace me so I have a usable exactly. amount of battery life. Exactly. You got to make the call. The A battery should not be dying within less than an hour, you know? And like, especially the pro once you change that OEM battery, it's never the same. You put one of those aftermarket batteries, they're good for a couple months yeah, and they're just fucking depleting right away. See, but see how what, look what you're using to fucking run this podcast. It's like a MacBook Air. It's like it doesn't run like it used to. But oh, if I unplug this thing, it dies immediately. But the thing I, is, it needs to be plugged in. A computer PC equivalent probably yeah. wouldn't even be able to do what it's doing if it had the same specs. Oh, it's crazy. Like my girlfriend, she has a MacBook Air. I see her exporting 4K videos, and what it's doing on that like 
on its limited hardware versus my desktop PC upstairs that I built for that. video editing. It's crazy the compiling speed on the MacBook Air. They do a lot that and that's good engineering. That's like you're doing the comedy analogy. It's like taking an apple, one a shitty comic would take two bites out of it as like a bit or a concept. They'll like attack it two lines and get whereas a pro comic would bite it to the core. They uh, like fully explore this topic and bit and then move on, right? Apple does that where they they take a finite amount of hardware um capacity and they actually optimize for its use so it's like they're getting a lot more out of four gigabytes dd3 than a pc is exactly. right but it's double the price right so it's like it does come at a cost and they also factor apple has so much shit factored in like everything we buy from apple you know what's built into that price i know they're crazy ass apple stores you go to apple stores everything is built into that price their employees their store the store is four stories high but it's only a one floor. <laughs> it's got like 18 devices there. It's like, what is the cost? I get, I get having the importance of having a footprint, but having this store here, I want, is this just to like, this is just more having your footprint in the market physically than it is this <sighs> store itself recouping the cost, I would think. What's crazy what, is What like, does this place cost? How is that translated value now that COVID has changed? Like if you think about office buildings. Oh, I heard they just spent twelve billion uh, making a new campus. It's like twelve what's, billion. What's gonna happen, man? Like, watch all these companies. You know who are good people to have in your life? If you got a barber in your life or something, or like a dentist or somebody that talks to a lot of people, you'll you'll hear like, yeah, my company. Uh, we were supposed to go back in January, but they said no. We're giving up the lease on the on the property, so we're not gonna have an office anymore. We're just gonna work from home. So many companies are like that. A huge, my buddy works for a supplier, uh, Cooper Standards in the States, huge supplier. And like their engineering and like sales office, it's got to have 100 people in it at least. They're not renewing their lease. Done. They're just all of you are working like huge layoffs. And then those who are still around permanently working from home. I love it. Which, yeah, it, it makes so much more sense. If you think about it, working out of an office for the most part is just... It's like I'm paying you a full-time salary. The only way I know that you are committing those hours is if you are in this building during the hours that I pay you for, right? And if you have a professional role that it's like performance-based, as long as you meet your metrics, it doesn't matter where the fuck you are, right? If you're all already traveling to client sites and shit, do you really need to go back to that cubicle? Can't you just operate from a home office? And that's what they're doing. Like this building was like four stories. It was huge. I can't imagine just... The addition to their bottom line, just cutting this lease. You know what I mean? Man, listen to this. My girlfriend works for uh, like one of the like major four companies. There's like these like big accounting firms. Like major four for who? Oh, like Deloitte, like Deloitte KPMG, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and, Morgan Stanley. Uh, they had a system at the office where you didn't have a desk or an office. Yeah, they just was like rotate. So okay. every day you could just have like your shit that you have. It's like less stuff around and you go to a desk. Might not have been the desk you were at Deloitte's yesterday. the same thing. You rent it out, right? Yeah, basically. Yeah, right. Yeah. So it's that's not conducive to like COVID. Oh, no, not so at that, all. Even just like think about their management is like, wow, we can't even bring them back because we didn't have a, a clean setup anyways. Bro, I I, I, I work or what's it called? I work or something? Yeah, yeah. The we, people we that work. would rent. We, we work. work. Yeah, they would rent huge. Uh, that is the model that has been just destroyed Yo, by COVID. You want to hear something disgusting? Go for you it. can climb the CN Tower. There's like a CN Tower walk, and they do it in the mornings. It's like for charity or whatever. And you want to get there early. They open it up about 5 a.m. And you want to get there early because by the time it's about 7 a.m., thousands of people go to climb the CN Tower. Like just the staircase. The whole staircase for charity. Yeah. It's a big thing. You want to get there early because if you get there around 7, all of the people breathing all the way up, it's wet on the bottom floor. Oh my God! So think about that for a second. That's fucking like just Dude. the condensation Holy and fuck. CO two like breath. That's just, disgusting. And they're all like running up there, just like fucking right behind each other, like little like. Uh, it's training breath too. It's not like just normal breath. It's all yeah. <sighs> yeah, they're like okay. I've been I'm up like 30, 50 sets of stairs here. You're like fuck. I gotta dig deep. Literally wet. Yeah, wet. Yeah. Like seriously. the railing is like wet. There's condensation water, on everything. If I spilt this water, like that. That's fucking disgusting from droplets that's disgusting and what so you pay just to get the opportunity to run up and it's for people who want 
it's for those like you pay to get sick. Super yeah, you pay to get sick. You it's a super driven overachievers who wake up like Mark Wahlberg style. Wake up four a.m. I got to run somewhere. Let's run up there, pay money. Isn't it Don't. odd sometimes the correlation between super healthy shit? And like hilarious consequences. You're <laughs> yeah, like, why right. the fuck would like oh, the Boston sh- Marathon getting <laughs> exploded? <laughs> Jesus, right? That's, is that not the go-to but example? Like, yeah, all those like, people wow. that are like healthy and like they've been training and now they're just succumb to a random terrorist attack. It's like, wow. what the fuck? Because think of how much po- like positivity around that lifestyle. They probably like they never entered a room where somebody was like, yeah, my brother's a marathon runner. You know what I mean? Like when you're that type of guy. It's who you are. You don't fucking, you get new balance because you're always like, I got to walk better and shit. Oh, yeah. You have tendinitis, but you yeah. still run like you still crazy. Run. You eat greens. You're always like. Hey. You've always got a tennis ball under for like, what's it called? That yes. thing? The, I forget what it's called, but like the under the foot thing. And I've even, I mean, I'm speaking to this because I've even been this guy, but like everything is a fucking thing I got to tell you about. Like, oh, dude, I'm using this new lotion. You know when you fucking pull your hamstring and you want to run another 2K? You're like, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're, like, yeah. you're like, Jesus, sit down, man. <laughs> David then, Goggins, man, haven't you heard it, man? You break yourself if you want to achieve yourself. No, bro. And just, those guys die have a heart attack. Yeah, right? Actually, I uh, I came by some clickbait things saying David Goggins, you know, lied or something. And I, I didn't even click it, but. It sounded like there was some sort of scam where maybe he embellished all that hyped up Rogan stories. Be hilarious if like he got hit by like a bus. I mean, God, like hopefully not. But I mean, the guy's a runner. That's a kind of ironic shit. It's like so healthy, man. We're out here trying to be our best self, and then a fuck. Someone just cuts a red. Yeah, bus clips him. I mean, you don't want that. You don't want to see that, but people. Are, yeah, if he was an artist, he'd make him explode. Remember, I don't know if you know Nujibis. He was a producer out of uh, uh, Japan, but when he died, that's that's the whole that's the catch twenty two of art. You know, you'll never be as big as you are the moment you die. Do you the know how the moment you die? Every Toronto rapper that died in the last two years, half of us didn't even know their name until they said, "Too Slimmy Slim got killed in fucking Young Street." And you're like, "Too Slimmy Slim," and you go on Spotify and you're just listening to it. Man, this guy was. Yo, man, this guy was the shit, you know? Depending on how much the women in our lives love us, like this podcast would be 10 times funnier if immediately after we both died. Yeah, right? Oh, bro. Oh, but it has to be posted, though. People would be, be like, posted. oh, my God, those guys were smarter than we ever gave them credit for. Bro, I think about that. I'm like, man, if I died right now, yeah. I know my numbers would pop. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they would, they'd go back. It'd be like Tupac. Tupac was sick. We loved Tupac. But the second he died, everyone's like, this guy was Jesus. You know what I mean? Like, his word was bond like this. The second Tupac died, he got, like, solidified into pop culture and, like, into the history of rap more so than he could have ever in life. Right there. That's what I'm talking about. Tupac and Biggie. Those are two guys. That's the whole reason I have them up there. In, like, mid-20s, they go out. And we still blast their songs in the club every night throughout the world. But you almost, like, there's, like, a sick, you'd rather die at that. On paper. There's a, it's a sick idea, but I'm enjoying my life, and I've aligned my life with well, you, what I like to do. So I'd rather if you think about it, try to we take get this to, to be, fruition. We get to be 30, 40, and fifty, probably the coolest time, because uh, you got to think, a lot of rules are going to change. Like if somebody was just born, by the time they're twenty, their rights and freedoms are going to be so skewed by the internet. It's already happening. Oh yeah, like weed is legal and like it got legalized here two years ago. Yeah. Like look at weed now, right? That's a perfect example of how quickly we all change. Weed was generally like effectively legal, whereas everyone got it. But if you were like a disenfranchised group, the police could fuck with you more, right? (laughs) If you had a gram on you, white kid versus black kid, it's different consequences, that type of shit. Then suddenly the, the government's like, you know those Black Friday sales? Where, like, uh, South Park, the Black Friday episode. You know, like, they're standing in front of the door and there's a hundred people outside. Remember, open up. And he's like, the security guy's like, no, not yet, not yet. All right, now go. And then they they go like crazy. That's pretty much. and kill five people. That's Canada with weed dispensaries. It's legal. It's illegal. It's illegal. It's a hundred thousands of them outside. We want to sell. We want to sell. It's illegal. And now it's legal. And they open the door. Bro, every day you walk on the streets here in Toronto, there's a new dispensary opening up. You know what I hate Every about Every corner has a dispensary here. You know what I hate about dispensaries? I like I like people, but I don't like people. 
And I went to the dispensary today, and I just don't like too much interaction. Oh my god, bro! I'm so happy. This happened to me just yesterday. I had that exact same thought. Just like, I, what is this? I'll say if you say, "Hey, this weed's good. Hey, this is good. This is good." I'm gonna say yes to all three. Spend more money than I want to just shut you up. This guy, we're trying to get Andre now. We're trying to get one joint, Blue Dream, one of my favorite good. strains. Yeah, it's good. Three pack. We don't want that. We're taking a week, a week off starting today. We're like, we just want one. He goes, sorry, it only comes in three packs. But just get it and save the other two for later, you know? <laughs> and he's just lingering. It's like, why are you lingering, bro? He wants to make the sale. He's literally just, no, no. He lingered and he walked away and he's and he keeps going, <laughs> he's got the fakest laugh. It's like, just wait. Imagine LCBO people are like, if you get at every LCBO people have a line of people. Imagine they're just like, mm, you're going to have fun tonight. And then the, the next Some person comes. Mm, wow, I wish I was you. Nobody does that at LCBO. They don't, LCBO, they're in and out. I've never had somebody give me banter. I had a, okay, so at DuPont and uh, at DuPont and Huron, actually, where I used to live, there's a lady there. She's got a lot of personality. But that shit's dead because of phones. We're always on our phones. So for people like that, we don't want it. I just want to go in there and, yeah, here's what I want. Three of this, two of this, one of this. Get in and out. This lady today, this guy. So it was just her and this guy, and they just opened. I get in there. Is it LCBO? No, this is a weed. Weed, weed song, gotcha. L- an LP. Got, uh, Licensed producer. Is, yeah, I know, Canada. So I get in there, and the one guy's like, yeah, she knows we're here. Like the guy holding the door to let everybody else know that it's open. And also, I hate when people fucking like, take an onus. Like they got to let me know shit. Like, if there's nobody at the door, I would just wait. You know what I mean? Because this guy was at the door. Are you the security guy? No, he was just a customer. Okay. And he looks at me and he goes, don't worry, man. They know we're here. I'm like, didn't fucking ask. <laughs> Wasn't worried, dog. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> it's, it's 10. They're fucking open. Like, I get it. <laughs> so I get in there. And now with COVID, because you're, you're wrapped up in how close people are sometimes. Like, I try not to think about it unless you happen to be of a certain age. And I'm like, why are you 68? And two feet away from me. Yeah, right. Especially when there's like space. Like Dan Brennan the other day. Yeah. <laughs> like, why are you? Here? Why are you doing this, bro? Every time now you go into an elevator, like my girl's building, it says two per two limit per elevator. We click down, the elevator opens up. It has two people in it. Pretend it's always like you, you guys cool with us coming in. They're like, yeah, yeah, come in. You know what we do, my girlfriend and I? Yeah. We pretend we don't know each other. We pretend we're two separate parties because if they ask us as a couple, yeah, they're like, yo, can we come in? And it's like, well, I don't know her. So like, you have to ask me and her and you don't have enough time in an elevator to get pop. That's so questions. funny, dude. Uh, that Steal reminds- that. Steal that. You Bro, one time I walked into the elevator. This is when it first was like they're enforcing the two person <laughs> oh, yeah. limit. It was two chicks. I walk in and she goes, I, uh, excuse me, sir. And it's level two and we're going to G, one floor. I walk in. Uh, excuse me, sir. It, it's too limit. As she says, it's too limit. The door closes, <laughs> yeah. and then I'm just in. like, "So," <laughs> and then it just goes one floor, and I get out. You know what? Fucks? Uh, it's too limit. You know what fucks with me when I get into an elevator and it smells like the cologne of whoever was in, or the perfume of whoever's in there. I'm like, how can I not get sick if I can smell this? You know what I'm saying? Like you're just. I didn't realize how much stuff just lingers. That's why at hospitals they go, please, you know, nope. fragrance free and right? all that stuff. And I used to wear Killing cologne a lot. Now, for some reason, I've backed off a of cologne because I realized as I gotten older that everyone kind of has a natural scent. Like if you remain clean, yeah. you kind of build this natural scent that is you. Yes. And it's like, okay, I don't need to mask it with this random Calvin Klein thing that I'll spray Whatever. You know, I used to have like three different kinds and be like, because my dad comes from the era where it's like you have cologne. Oh, yeah. You wear cologne when you leave. You know what I mean? It's That's, a flex. It makes you presentable. It's a flex. But yeah, 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 yeah exactly. Like, my, yeah, I'm doing fine financially. Look, I smell good. <laughs> right? You know I what I mean? Good. Yeah, don't question my finances. Look how I smell. Right? We don't have that anymore. Not, not, and now that I'm, I don't really spray anymore, now it's like when someone walks, like when there's a couple behind me and I can. Yeah, it's brutal. If you're behind me and I can smell you, you you haven't even passed me yet. It's like, yo, you sprayed too many times. See, but that's what I be I'm worried about is like that must happen with your own must. I just don't pick it up because But that's it's what I'm natural. saying, you shower. But it's natural. You keep it within like reasonable levels. But you just have a natural waft. Do you know what I mean? But at one point that waft mixes with actual BO that builds. Yeah, and then you're You dead. shower and you get out 15 minutes after that shower, how you smell, that's kind of you. 
That's true. Right? Two days after that, that's you and B and sweat and fucking this and fucking toe cheese. I don't know what the fuck. Dandruff. Right? Those are all smells that are like, that's just like dirt and dead skin cells accumulating on you. I don't want to call that your actual waft. That's like dirt accumulating on you. And it's like when you rip it off and you get to that level one base cleanliness, that's your actual smell. Speaking of... Uh, I'm talking out of my ass here. Keep that in mind. This is totally I gotta be honest, <laughs> unsubstantiated that, that shit. That sounded like some smell science. Uh, smell? Smell science. What does that mean? Just smell. I smell, I smell wrong. Damn, that was a pun, huh? But smell science? Like, yeah. I could believe what you're saying. I could do a TED talk about that. But you that. brought up Asian people. I just want to let you. When did I bring up Asian people? When you're like walking behind an Asian couple or something? No, 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 no. no. But a couple that you can smell. Oh, but I pictured an Asian couple. You know what? They're Indian, which is technically South Asian. Well, I'm almost always ever trapped behind just the Asian ethnicity. Oh, just because their pace? Yeah. You're a quick walking guy. Quick. You, you need to live in New York, by the way. I you got that New York pace. I think that's dead for me. You got that New York pace. Oh, yeah, that's a, that's a great thing. Let's talk about that. Actually, we come to that. Pre-COVID, the mecca for comedy is New York. Every comedian that's serious about comedy knows that New York is in there uh, down the road for them, so to speak. Post-COVID, now things have shifted a little. It's like... I don't think the how mecca... How do you feel about... For anything, New York now. I don't think the mecca for anything is anywhere anymore. Well, because of the internet now. Why? Wow, it's always been like that, and I think that. So for like for like this, all COVID did was make stuff that we're already trying to do more of, have to make the people that are like in t- on top of us, like boomers, do it now. Okay, can you reword that? I'm confused as fuck. So like your boss is like a fucking fifty year old dude. Okay. You know, if you're working a job, it's not like me or you that are employing people. It's the people that are older that are not so comfortable on the phones. They're like, oh, I'm just getting used to my iPhone. Or I'm just getting used to video calling. Now, with COVID, everybody's like, no, no, I have to be good on this. You got to get up to speed. I have to know how to use this. So, automatically, it's like, to go to New York, the whole ed- the whole entity of the comedy funnel is I need exposure. And where do you get exposure? Where all there, there's most eyes on the planet, and that's New York City. Especially when you're at night and you're doing it as much as we did. Because if you think about it, we got funnier by virtue of practice. So it's like Kobe, Michael Jordan, LeBron James, they're still shooting. As long as you're shooting, it's good. Correct. But with COVID though, right now, like in Toronto specifically, I'm getting up on stage once a week max right now. Yeah. Are shows back up in New York? I Are people know. doing nightly shows? Is Cellar running in New York? I'm not sure. I think it's I think it's starting to get back open, yeah. Because remember, Andrew Schultz had that video, first time back on stage since Corona. That was pre-Wave 2. But I don't even know if they're doing Wave 2 shit in, uh, in New York. I don't know if that's a Canada thing where we lock down again. I don't know if New York did a second shutdown like Toronto. The honest benefit I see to being able to say you have like mainstay in New York or live in New York is if you're just easier to work with internationally. Like if you can be licensed like visa in america oh yeah you're trying to get a commercial there you're trying to be in a movie it's just easier to work with you your currency you have it all but then i'm thinking like do i give a fuck like not to say that my my goals have changed but i guess my maturity on what i'm looking at has changed like okay i want to be famous before but i my dreams came from watching people get on the tonight show same thing for all of us if you're like our age it's like the dream what we had is very different now. It's a different beast altogether, especially when Bill Burr is like, it's better to own your own thing and sell less yeah. than have somebody own it. It's better own 100% of like nothing. your 5% versus nothing of 100, you know, yeah. 20 times that, right? JoJo is a good example. You know that song, the JoJo Girl? Uh, Get out right now. That chick? That's not bad. Yeah. yeah. So that bitch, yeah. she got locked down by Sony. She made that song and then couldn't make music because they were like, no, we're not letting you do anything because they're not going to give you the studio and they'll just lock you out of this oh, yeah, I haven't even heard that name JoJo in forever. That's why. She didn't stop making, like, think about it. She didn't get famous and then stop trying to make music. You ever think about that? Like, where do these people go? It's because it's they like get, a product. They get, in, bro, I'm literally reading a book right now called all, Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business. And holy fuck, it's man. Terrible. It is it's highway terrible, robbery. Man. It is highway robbery. It's written by a lawyer. It's crazy what they used to get away with, and they still get away with. 
Uh, but holy shit, man. Like, for instance, they still, a lot of contracts still have a, uh, 10% of like, we won't pay artists 10 um, royalties on 10% of sales for breakage fees. Breakage has been in contrast since the 60s when records came because records were made out of material that would break. Yeah. Like 10 out of 100 shipped would break. And that clause has continued through CDs that had a way less breakage. And now with digital streams, people still pay for breakage. Wow. It is lit fit, not even a thing. There's so much uh, grandfathered in clauses in record deal and music industry contracts that are just highway robbery, man. And you just need amazing lawyers to first of all identify to you hey th they have these clauses and even if you know those things are written in there unless you are a big act or someone so promising you have no bargaining leverage to even adjust the contract so if, like what's it, the point it, exactly like if, if you're just on the cusp and sony wants to sign you and you get a lawyer and the lawyer's like they're gonna fuck you here 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 they're gonna they're essentially taking 95 percent. and if you were a pr and and if you had leverage they can only take 80 percent you know, you're getting fucked either way, but it's like, they'll take everything. It's like, okay, but we can't change this contract at all because you have no leverage. They're not going to miss a second of sleep not signing you. So what are you going to do? Do you want to sign with Sony and, and give them all your money for the possibility of blowing up through their promotion? Or do you want to just go into the ether of nothingness? So like, that's what New York is for, to get into that type of contract but, if but you, I don't know. But for comedy, we're not really in You know what I see the value of New York still as is that, and this will, because of COVID and things, this will change pretty much because a lot of people, there was a lot big exodus from New York. But like all of the cream of the crop, historically, all of the people from their little markets who have reached the pinnacle of their markets moved to New York. So by virtue of moving to New York, you become a small fish in a big pond. You become, you go to the grand stage. You you enter the World Coliseum. And to survive in the World Coliseum, like here, we're in a Toronto's Coliseum. Our best people are like, the world doesn't know them, you know? It feels like you're in the Toronto Coliseum because the reality of our comedy is that. But, but like, I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about only stand up. Obviously, podcasting and everything is like, like the world stage because it's online. There's guys in the, in the city with the camera that have amassed millions of followers on youtube from toronto and they get to go around the world and do all these amazing shoots and the same thing can be said in any business so the value of new york right there is lower the other value for me personally is i've been there i loved it i can't say i would i don't want to live there it's an amazing place but i'm getting older and the things that i love and enjoy more about life are the things that are slowing down because I'm realizing like if I speed myself up, I don't want to speed this up. We only get one chance, especially with this sickness and shit. And then you realize how dirty New York is. It's like, fuck, I don't want to live on top of a bunch of people in a smaller space for just rats left and right. Yeah. Just for this thing that I've propped up that it isn't even what it used to be. Like if I'm on the cellar, I might not even be on the other thing or I might not even be in the movie. I might've just had that. And maybe that's it good enough for me, but it's not going to be because the nature of the city makes me need to get more. Like Andrew Schultz couldn't stop at getting on the cellar, but I bet that's where his dream was. But now he's like, I got to be a Patreon guy or like I got to be on YouTube. But that's how it is with all of us. As soon as we meet our goal, we have to set another goal. You have to always be working towards goals and you get to a point where I guess ideally you get to a point where you can honestly be like, wow, I've achieved everything I wanted, you know, 25 years ago when I set out on this path, I've achieved everything. And then that's, did you watch, did you listen to Kanye Rogan um, podcast? I did. I thought Kanye is just a mess. Oh my God. The level of ranting. But remember I always go as paradigm shift. Oh, that, that that's what I say. That's, that's my new word. Paradigm yeah. shift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember that? that? Crazy. Like, fuck, what was the point I was trying to make? Can I go off on Kanye for a second? No, wait, wait, before that, I just wanted to wrap that up. Yeah, 25 years in, if you achieve what we wanted, at that point, you got to say, I've achieved my goals and I still have life left. I have financial freedom. I have all this freedom. I need to, now what is it going to be? Is it, I want to give back to all the people that were in my shoes 25 years ago, all the struggling artists. Do I want to help them? Do I want to help hungry people? You got to... Once there's a turning point in your life, I think once you achieve success, which is what you ask yourself, like, 
what do I want to do for the world? Because I'm at that point where I've, I've self-actualized. I've gotten the things that now it's like doing another set. I've done theaters. I've done all this stuff. And I'm going to keep doing that stuff. But now that fire within me to be acknowledged and loved is not there anymore because I did it. I got acknowledged by the people in the industry. Now it's like I have all these freedoms. What do I want to do with that? Well, to answer that's that. That's what LeBron is at right now. That's what all these people that are doing all this stuff, they hit that point. To, to go in line with that and kind of what Kanye is saying is like the goal for me isn't another goal. The goal isn't that. It was whatever. The goal is a lifestyle based on what I like to do. So can I create a successful lifestyle where my girlfriend and potential wife have like the shit that we want? We can do what we want. We're not bound by like paycheck to paycheck. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying like that's created stress. That's in a my bad life. thing. Well, no, but for We're some people, be, that's no, 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 no. No one is. Yeah, but I'm not trying to take away being, from that. I'm just I know. I get say, that. You know being I mean? bound paycheck to paycheck is not a good thing. No, no, no. I'm Period. Just, I'm just Even say, people who are in that situation can't be like, this is hey, this is the way I live, baby. Yeah. I don't want it any but other way. I've met people like that. I was there for years. I'm yeah. still there. I'm waiting on fucking CRB every two weeks to live. It's and not it's a good way to live. No, but You and, can't be complacent at this point. And what I'm trying to get is like, can I make a lifestyle of like, you know, having a job, getting photography, doing podcasting, doing comedy? And where does that center around? And I realize like, it has nothing to do with, with where you are, where I am, because me doing the New York thing, thinking that for me is just like I procrastinate with anything else. Like I'm going to put that as a pillar and be like, the reason my career never went. No, Matt here, let's look at it another way. Ryan Long is killing it in New York. His plan was centered around that place and he's already achieved a lot of things and where the market really was in Toronto was nothing like it might look now based on where COVID took it. But that's a different conversation. Now to wrap it up in Kanye, what was annoying about that podcast was like, now think of a guy who's had so much experience, could have talked to like contracts and could have really dove in and chose not to and kept it really fluffy and, you know, like Jesus and open ended. I'm sure he yeah, yeah, does yeah. have all those beliefs, but it's like you could have added value for an artist instead of just saying, own your master's. Well, how do I have that conversation, Kanye? Like, teach me how to be the business person that gets the deal with Adidas. But it's tough. You're only looking at that from an artist point of view. I ain't a consumer. Like, that's like a very because any there's millions of people who listen to it. They're probably like, "Fuck, I wish he went more in on Kim. Fuck, I wish he went talked more about his mom. Fuck, yeah, why didn't you talk course. about Chicago?" Everybody's pulling in this. It, there's no way to appease all of them, right? But there's but, just no sense. There's just no through line. It just didn't make uh, sense. I couldn't make it through an hour, bro. There was no give give and take. Did you listen to the whole thing? Yeah. I listened to an hour. I'm like, bro, Rogan doesn't... I can't listen to one person talking and then interviewing themselves. And it'd be like, and, and I told that. And and you're thinking, why is that? Another way of this... And he just... He finishes a thing, says the next thing, and starts answering that. Well, the weirdest w w shit was like, Rogan was like... Wasn't calling him out. He was enabling him. He was like, oh, man, it's so cute. It was almost like... Oh, so cute how you tied that together like that. Like Rogan was watching a guy struggle at stand up, trying to get the joke off. And he was like, oh, you know, with a bit more work, that might make sense. Yeah, like he was. And Kanye got to a point where he was very careful with his. He yeah. took so long to speak because he's almost very careful. I don't know if he's coming up with it on the spot or these are well thought out or it's like North American culture make makes me want to uh, makes me want to think poorly of that person who speaks slowly. But a lot of Asian cultures are the opposite. You know, when you talk slowly, it is deliberate. It is indicative that you thought about what you're saying. Yeah. Whereas North American culture, if you're talking slowly, you're like, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. Look at how long he's taking to answer. He does, he's just coming up with the answer. You should know right away if you know, you know. We're all like, say it quick. Oh, he said it quick. He knows his stuff, right? So then I want to get back to New York for a second about where you got to be. Well, here's the thing. Here's just the reality of New York. There's nowhere else in the world that has that density of opportunities to be on stage, period. That yeah. is the appeal of New York. 100%. If you want to go anywhere in the world, if you want to be able to get on stage three to four plus times a night, there's only one place for you in the world, really. I mean, there might be well, like no, there might be markets that you can do five spots a night no, no, no. on one night here and there. You're just look, but you're just looking at it in the in the same way of like, okay, we get up every day and then at night I go and do comedy. No, I'm talking about I'm doing shit during the day. But if you're at a point where you are like having a lot of people pay attention to your stuff and you have a lot of subscribers, wherever you are becomes four or five times a night. 
Okay, I get that. But if people are watching you, if like people, just because the eyes on you are, uh, the numbers are satisfactory, who's looking at you, it doesn't mean the product you're giving them is of the caliber that you want. And how do you get it to the caliber that you want? But what, taking shots, but what practice. Do you mean? But what do you mean? Like, th th that's, that's what I mean is it's a, it's a certain type of sharpness at that point. It's, it's not like the only knife to get. You know I get I mean? that, but I'm still at a blunt knife. We can have this conversation after 10 years of grinding, then in that 10 to 20 year gap, it's totally debatable as to how many sets are you actually getting a return on investment on where I'm still at the point in my craft where I need just raw bangs. I need to be shooting 100 free shows a night. But he, I'm still at the rookie level. I think, that's, I think that is a good way to look at it, but try this on. Yeah, you get more reps in New York, and they're great reps, and it's some of the hardest people to do comedy in front of. You get really funny. But Mark Norman would rather have been Chris D'Elia. Chris D'Elia was doing three, four spots a night. No, no, I know. Improv, but, Laugh but Factory, just, But just think about it. Like, store. If Chris D'Elia or Brian Callen or Brendan Schaub... Brian Callen... Any of those New York guys, yes. as much as they love New York, and they love New York, and they love being New York guys, if they looked at it from like a career perspective, it looked easier in like an LA or it looks easier for the guy on Instagram who's got a million followers who says, Hey, fucking watch me at this theater, pay a hundred bucks where they're cutting their teeth. And I've listened to them say this on podcast where they're like every night and you get the reps and that's awesome. But at the end of the day, we all go to bed with like, you know, this is worth something what I'm doing here. And I know what it's worth. And I see other guys and I see other girls or whatever. And they get certain things. It's like, I still live with four people and it's in New York. And it's like for New York, and I'm not saying that that would be either of us, but it's like to say you're going to go and smash and make it just based on that. Like you look There is no make it. Exactly. I literally think of New York exactly. literally as a master's degree in comedy. New York is your master's degree. You get your and bachelor's in the open mics. It is that. You get your master's when you go to a top level uh, city that provides you the opportunity to get up on stage consistently, whether it's Toronto, Chicago, San Francisco, L.A., or New York, New York and LA obviously being the best, right? Getting to those spots. And th that is your master's. And then your PhD will say that is done on the road. That is done through tier uh, touring with the rest of your career. And my goal isn't to, like, let's say comedy. Let's, let's make comedy the analogy of Mr. Olympia. Okay? So you can say, yo, I think you're looking at it more of like if you want to be, if you want to be a, a contender at Mr. Olympia. I'm looking at it in the sense of I want to be in the gym as much as possible to get there. But you're looking at it as in, yo, there are guys who got there w without really being in the gym that much in other markets, right? And it's like my main drive in everything I do and everything I've started is to get really good at classical stand-up. So that's still you, the thing but in it's my like heart. This. It's like, And you can't tell me Michael Jordan would have got to where he is. All you needed was a well, basket and a ball. Like that's it. You just got to look. But at But a like, basket and a ball once a week wouldn't have done it. But yeah, but you're not gonna get it. You're only getting it once a week because there's a pandemic. So the other side is that. But you. But then look at once like I get once the pandemic is up, I get a 15 times a week, right? Why? Wow, that's where we were back then. We did. Yes, but I'm saying if it levels up to exactly what it was pre-COVID, 15 sets a week, so to speak. We'll 15 get, well, sets of that, let's get to that five. In a let's get to that in a second. Okay. Where you're lining, look, you're talking about your goal in New York. I think those are separate because obviously, if you feel like being in New York is going to help you do that, just the value of New York up. for a stand up comedian still exists, is my argument. Of course it does. But ubiquitously, it's like saying, well, that's just Harvard, man. Like, tons of people get super smart from fucking. Uh, but Harvard is not a meritocracy. New York is a meritocracy. Harvard it appears, has legacy, it has appears, nepotism left and right. But it, it that's appears, a terrible, it like, appears to be a, a meritocracy. But. It's just like... There's politics and everything. Yes, I get that. Look at it like Kung Fu. And you were saying Mr. Olympia. These are all good examples of like a champion coming from a certain teaching, right? But there's still people that come from far and wide that are wildly amazing and you are left with questions instead of knowing everything from this mecca of New York. Oh, I mean, case in point, look at Jim Carrey. Exactly. He never went through New York. So it's like, I think that New York, as like, especially with the pandemic especially with what's going on with online, especially with everything, et cetera, et cetera. You have to look at it if you're somebody that doesn't have a clear goal of like, like you, like I want to be in New York is like the value isn't as absolute. It's only for one thing. 
like for comedy and like but that's the unless you're leveraging like your skills in editing and all that other stuff everything that i'm working on and i've built here moves with me wherever i go so being in the location is more of a benefit for stand up specifically my days are my days for to do whatever i want this thing this whole effort i take it with me to seattle to wherever i end up fucking sudbury you know anywhere i go i can do this obviously who you have access to as far as guests that shoots through the roof in New York. Like I'm saying, now you're in the big time. Now you're in the major coliseum. You're around people who want it the most. You're around people who want it the most, man. Excuse me. Surround yourself with more successful people if you want to be like hungry. Of course. That's, like a, that's, a, that's just a known it, strategy. You can find it anywhere. But that's what I'm saying. It is. It, it's like... It's like the United States. It's like you could find geniuses everywhere, but ambitious geniuses, more times than not, try to get into the United States and work for United uh, companies in the United States. The yeah. Apples, the Googles, the Facebooks, yeah, the tech giants here. You also have to consider how much of it is publicized versus not publicized. Like just as much as Kanye is out there talking about you know, how rich he is and how good his taste is on Joe Rogan's podcast, there's tons of billionaire musicians and, and people in fashion who aren't saying any of the shit he's talking about who are umpteen times more wealthy. Who You know what I mean? It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, okay, yeah, I agree with you about the New York thing, but like, You'll get just as good. You you get more than anything you want. I think that any opportunity is always leveraged by what means are the easiest. Like I've read, I've read so many of the stand up books, and I've everything always is like they always worked in an area that was the best for them. Like you know, for Kevin Hart, New York was a stone's throw away from Philly, so he could drive there. For Bill Burr and a lot of these guys, Boston. it was like Boston, right? Yeah. Like they only went to New York because. The people in Boston were helping them to get there. It wasn't like we have to go. Fucking uh, Bill Hicks was doing it in Texas. Now, obviously, it's rounded back and Joe Rogan's going to have the thing there. But it's like wherever it is, especially now, it's like, yeah, you're right. You will get masterfully good at stand-up. But if it's not putting money in your pocket to leverage that for that, sometimes, and more often than not, I've seen it at less return than what it was worth. And very few guys like Ryan go there and you're like, you are making it. I just think of it as the ultimate gym in the world. And if we look at it as we do as as bodybuilders, I want to go through that gym. I don't want to go live in New York forever. Don't get me wrong. No, no, of course. Whether it's 12 months to 36 months, one to three years, whatever it may be. I think that I, in my career of doing this and trying to go where I want to go, I love, like, even from a romantic point of view, I want to go to New York. You know what I mean? And I've been in New York a lot of times. I'm talking about live in New York, make it into the scene, beat beat the scene. These are all, it's like Kevin Hart said in that, that uh, podcast, life has a game-like feel to it. Life is a game, you know? And once you realize it's a game, you can start to actually level up strategically, level up consistently. I actually look at New York as a level I want to go beat so bad. I want to go beat that level. But I also think it's a part of like you can probably access it. It's not necessary. I can get there, but I want to go there. You could probably access it without ever even having a fucking residence there. You could probably have so much appeal there and stage time. Like all of everything that ever was is different. Oh, yeah. No, you know, we're speaking in the flux of things. We're like, as like the. the floor is being swept out from under us. We're like, oh, what's going to happen now with the floor? You know what I mean? So it's like we got to see where we're going to be standing after this to even make that call afterward. But but I see, I see it like this is the best thing to happen to everybody in terms of all the stress went away. Anything that we propped up, like even what we're saying about New York, like if you have comedians that are like, I have to get to New York, COVID's like, you don't have to be anywhere. Yeah, period. Period. Yeah. You can just do whatever you want. Well, people will pay you. You they want you to have their products, they'll put it in your hand. Look, that's it. So like if and then if you keep going, it's like wherever I want to do the thing I want to do is really how I leverage that. So if you're like, yeah, I want to be in New York because I'm going to get this, then go and get it. But the old guard of like that's LA or New York are the only two places. No, in I don't think that's of it as dead. this is the only. That's oh, dead. not at all. Especially now with LA. LA is done. <laughs> you know what I mean? Fuck LA. I agree. Like, forget about it being the only way. 
right? Yeah. This is not something that I recognize as, yo, this is a necessity. It's not. This is something I want to do. Then you this is do a it. kid who wants to go to a school and wants to actually learn, is really into science and really wants to go to that school that's strong in science. And you're telling me, bro, you can get good at this. You can self-teach yourself. You can do it at any school. It's like, I understand that. I just love. This is the school for this subject, and I really want to go through that school. I know I'm gonna have a dope. career in this. I I want to make my way through that school. That's simply what it is. I That's want to awesome. do my master's in New York, is literally what it comes down to. Now, if we're not uh, like depending on uh, the pandemic, I'm assuming will pass and everything will go back to normal, such that all of the venues that were running stuff and the number of opportunities to get on stage won't change. Then yes, all this continues. But if there's some big sort of paradigm shift as Kanye said as to what is operating there then maybe I'll have to rethink it at that time I think it depends on the government uh, the United States government because that's going to be a huge because both sides are very different on how they even view COVID and then that determines what we do in Canada but yeah, businesses literally. are like starving and drowning so there's that so like again how we look at all that plus comedy plus all of it. This to me is a good thing because it's like, first of all, comedy doesn't matter at all right now in terms of trying to further your career because your career is how are you getting your shit to the audience? That's never been more evident. So if you actually do one show a week, if you're able to film it, like if you film that set you did in Kitchener and you put that out, that serves you way more than any other set from any other time in COVID. Oh, I mean, of course. Of course, right? But I don't want to drop my... That's like... That burns what I would... The next week's shit for anybody that would want you to You only come say out. that if nothing good happens. But what if somebody messages you and like, damn, a boss, that's dope. Like, can you make it out here? We need you to open for like... It's that's the type of shit that guys like us take away from ourselves because mm. we're so analytical. We're like, yeah, I got this. If this. I put it out, then they'll see the joke yeah. and the joke won't work. And it's the same people who saw it are going to be at the shows yeah, and we're yeah, overthinking yeah. it. But it's still dope and you yeah. can still do it amazing every time. So it's like, and that for me is the essence of where do I need to be? Where I need to be is in the mindset to put my shit out there for people to find me. Because anybody that I like to follow, oh, I, I find their shit. Literally. What's his name? Um... I told you watch that movie, The Opening Act. Check that out with uh, Jimmy O. Yang. We're in it. Yeah, we're not in it. But yeah, <laughs> but yo, Cedric the Internet Entertainer, Bill Burr, everybody's in this thing, man. Brett Ernst, <laughs> he's in it, bro. It's funny as hell. Check it out. But uh, Cedric the Entertainer plays pretty much a pro comic, and he gives advice to a young comic at some point. And he pretty much said, just work on your voice, because once you got your voice, your audience will find you. Yeah. Once you got your voice, the people come find you. I also started looking at uh, the whole process of stand-up differently. Like, for example, when we were at the Kitchener show, my attitude was like I was kind of mad. I was like in there to just like – I was like – I felt like I was fist fighting myself. You were piss fighting? I was like fist fighting myself. Oh, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. I was like, yeah. You were your own worst enemy. Yeah, I was just in, like, in a weird mood and I, I and I ran with it and that's good. And where before I would go and do stand-up and I'm like I got to get this to get this show. Now I realize like I just got to – feel it out like who i am like if it comes in five years and six years like it doesn't actually matter because when the fucking covid blows the ladder up and blows the whole game you're like i guess it really is just all about getting better like you you're hyper focused to that because you can't do as many shows here's what it really is for me and you're talking about delivering content to people and i am yeah you do it also. i deliver content to people all the time and I want to build a fan base, and I am building a, building a fan base. But what I don't like in the meantime is that anytime I've been running a show, I always have to get someone to headline it because my, my me doing 45 is not worth you coming out and paying for. I, I, I'm not going to put that out there. You know what I mean? I can do 25, and you and it's worth paying for, you know? But I'm not going to headline a show with 45, and I'm not going to go do, uh, like, have someone else do more time than me. Just I'm not going to do it like, what's his name from fucking uh, Entourage? Uh, Ari Gold yep. Jeremy Piven I'm not going to do it like him Where he goes out on a headlining tour And j and just uses his famousness To do 20 minutes of Hollywood stories at the end I don't want that I want to cultivate a proper Headlining set That I can tour with So when you come see me I am the headlining act You know what I don't like Is when me selling Making a show Getting all my friends to come out to it and me being the host, which is sick because I still do my act, 
But I want to be. I want to have somebody host, somebody feature, and I come out and headline that thing. Well, I mean, and to do that, that to me, you need reps. That to me just on sounds stage. like you're just obviously super ambitious. But you got to look at it like I do that, but I make it seem like not make it seem. I kind of market it, and in my head, it's like you're the person that put the show on. So putting it on is actually a bigger task than being the headline. I know. I get that, that you're looking at it from that, but I don't want, but I market it because my bit, my, so my, if I can't headline, which I can't, my, if I was giving this, if I, if I had an advisement company, we were like advertising, I would say to you is if you can't headline and that's the key, the golden goose of this project, I would market it as you're the proprietor of this. So your taste is the headliner. So you're cultivating the experience. Which- That's exactly what I'm doing. But I get no joy out of promoting it. I don't get no joy out of any of these things. But that's kind of like As compared to the actual act of doing the set itself. There's no ah, you're just there's not no there comparison. Yet. You're, get, you're getting there. But you got to try But I'm to- saying I don't want to, In the meantime, I'm just getting by by doing what you're doing. But I, it doesn't. It's not like yeah. I want to do the next. I'm not excited to do the next one. It's not the same as doing stand up. All that promotional side of it, where it's like I'm selling the show and I'm selling the headliner. I don't want to do all that stuff. I just want to be like, yo, I'm coming. See, but to me, that's just that's just practice for when you have to do it to sustain your career. But my problem like is when you're the going headliner. up once a week is it's going to take me a lot longer to get to this place I want to be than I than if I was going up. X times a week. But when you're the headliner, you, you don't think you're going to set everything up. You're doing everything short of hosting. So it's actually it in reverse. You're just the guy coming on last. Yeah. I mean, that's, but I'm so not going to. You gonna... should derive the joy now because the setup is actually the, the fact that you're good at it is what's going to help you headline faster. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, oh, so that's a good point. Well, because if you're like, hey, I can market the shit out of this, I, I'd rather be the headliner. Now the barrier is just the skills. Or the time. I just need to practice. And that's my problem. That's the whole point I've been making is how do I catalyze the skill? Why? You just are, you just, the pandemic fucking slowed you down. Like, think of people who are frantically doing You know, I'm, I'm weeping at a problem that affects every comedian. Of course. <laughs> Period. That's really the, pro- that's what it comes down but to. You I see think all these comics that are like frantically like, oh, let's get every show, every stage possible. Like, let's get out on stage and do all this stuff. It's like, I mean, you got to understand there's a long game, right? You got to see it's like, okay, well, they're trying to monopolize this thing. So if I feed into it now, I succumb to it later. Whereas if I understand like I'm trying to do 45 minutes or I'm trying to do 15 minutes so you can do 45 and I want to feature, right? And whatever pod we can fucking get, that's the goal. That Nobody's banging on my door for that. Oh yeah. So Likewise. I am not. I'm not feeling like fuck. I got to get up here, here, here. So that's why when I don't do 15 shows a week right now, I'm not freaking out. I'm just like, well, no one's banging on my door, which is the best part about our careers right now because I get to cultivate this with no one watching. I get to fall on my face where there's nobody in the audience. But it's one of those things where it's like plan, plan to live to 80, but live as if you're gonna die tomorrow type of thing, right? So that's what the knocking on the door for the set is. What I, what, uh, more than making a funny fucking TikTok or a pot or even the podcast or anything, I want to do a set. But I want to get in front of people funnier and do a set. doing less I, Oh, sets. I have, absolutely. You might have got funnier doing less Bro, sets in COVID. I got, once I was like some shows back in, I realized, man, like You're- something changed. All those videos I was doing helped my act in a way I can't quite, uh, like it's not tangible for me, but I can tell my the something changed. Well, I've the, developed the timing, the delivery. It's just like you got to see like how does that not make you question a little bit of the methodology? You got to practice, but it's because, also got to sink in. Because on a day to day basis, the feeling it is not comparable, and I want to replicate. I want to get to that. It's talking about like Kanye said, the lifestyle. I want a lifestyle of being getting the ability to get up on stage. Not every night because now with COVID, I realize that every night mentality is not necessary. That will burn you out in the long run. And that's what I'm trying to tell but you. But five nights a week. That's what I'm trying five to tell Five nights a week, uh, Sunday, take Monday, Tuesday off or whatever you end up doing. But Wednesday through to Sunday, Friday, Saturday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, do as many shows as possible. That's the prime time. But I, like, I like to think about it like when you make a nice steak or chicken or anything. You got to let it rest because it it's it allows the heat to go to, back, the juices to the stay spices in. spices to sink in. When we all got that time off of COVID, 
because I live with the comedians and their friends are like, man, there's no rest or whatever. It's like, no, it's just all that practice sunk in. It's like when you took a rest off the gym, the next week you're like, fuck, I'm strong. It's not because you were lifting every day. It's yeah. because your body, the problem is. Because it was addicted to lifting. We're just emotionally. We got addicted to lifting. We're emotionally, we're emotionally absent and we need it. We have an emotional void as comedians and it, we plug it in with the laughs. But like legit though, the problem is not. And I might not even be a problem, but the problem. By is the like, way, has there been any a podcast that has more stand up analogies than this one? Oh by the way, God, just, we're just going from stand up analogy man. to but it's the for next. life too. Like anybody pursuing something, they're emotionally in their way. Like if we think about it, there's people with less stand up ability than you or I or many people making more money in comedy than we could ever at their age. So if you think about that, it's like. Where am I messing this up? If yeah, I yeah. Have, I have that thought all the time. If I have the skills, yeah. how am I not? What am I doing wrong here? And it's the mindset. It's like, well, I have to have this to do this or this is this. It's like we all are, are not there. It's a simple formula. It's give people everything always. That's how companies like, what, why else would they come up with a new thing every day? Why are there sales all the time? So we can just get, your TV's old. It's like, I just got it. <laughs> yeah. You're like, no, new, new, now, now. You have to. It's like same thing for comedy. And the, the problem is the artist is like, no, I've been sculpting this for 10 years. It's like I want to buy 10. I don't want one. Mm. You only want one at a different social stage. Like when you're a millionaire, yeah, I want the guy who's in a mountain fucking beard, one sculpture. But like most people are going to Walmart. Correct. Most people are going to fucking Amazon. So it's like we're appealing comedy to Comedy for the people. masses. That's yeah. why when you look at a Bankus, a Ryan Long, their content, what it is. It's like, it's looking at what people are doing and talking about and then giving it back to them with your flavor. Same thing what your jokes are. It's like, hey, I had this experience with a casting director where they picked me because of my skin or they picked because of this. Yeah, I know you know that's real because you're on the other end at home sitting on the couch and I'm going to tell you how it feels. Mm, you know what I mean? So like yeah. that's what comedy is. So then I think about, well, fuck, what was I ever worried about I was just worried because you felt more of a race when you were in comedy before COVID. Oh, like, it really did. Yeah. I almost felt like if I didn't show up, people would be talking shit. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or like, oh, you know, you know, you get before COVID where you get, oh, oh, where well, have you been out of town? No. Oh, I just hmm, haven't seen you around. <laughs> you, you can't even go visit those comments. <laughs> you can't even go visit your parents in T suck. You go visit your parents for a weekend. They're like, oh, you move? Dude, did you move? Yeah, I like, right. No, I just decided to have a life. And there's like that stacking of attitudes on top of each other fucks you up. When you don't see the same five people at Rusty Nail and this fucking bullshit, you know, you're like, you're realizing they're contributing to my anxiety. I know that dumb lady who's always there on Tuesday. It's like, I don't need her approval. Tricks. Great comedian. Comedian tricks. Check them out. I talk to High him. level. Very fucking high. Yo, he told me, bro. I did a set with him, and this was amazing. It was very validating. He told me, he was like, yo, doggy, you're nice. <laughs> I was like, what? He's like, yo, keep it up. Keep at it. You're nice. I was like, like oh, shit. It. Oh, shit. He said to me very early on, and sometimes you get advice that you can't use anything with. It's like Michael Jordan be like, yeah, when you fucking fade away, and you're like, I can't even fade yet. <laughs> yeah. So he would be like, stay away from rooms where it's just all comics. Now, when you're just starting out, how the fuck... You can't. Because of every open mic. But then you realize what he meant. It's like, yeah, actually going there, the, 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 the jewel is how I feel. The jewel isn't, oh, this fucking one idea. You, you're funny all the time. You're only a comedian because you were drawn to it because you're like, motherfuckers are always laughing <laughs> when I'm around. And I like that. It makes me feel great. And I can, I can tap into it and I realize I got these funny thoughts. It's not like, oh, because, of, you know, the shit about laundry I got is hot. Yeah, yeah, it's not this bit. No, you're like, it's me. So then I go to Rusty Nail or wherever the fuck in, you were going. And you're like, I hate the fucking guy who runs the show. He makes me feel like I'm not as good as I am. And then other people see me in that weakened state. And then I'm not as good because they run other shows. And I need to perform better. So then you see a guy who only comes out once a week and he does really well. And then you feel even worse because you're out every night. And you're like, why is no one giving me the respect when I'm out every night? Mm. But it doesn't add up because all they want to see is good work. So that's why I said stay away from yeah. 
Yeah. Because you, you you really... I was you get into your sales. own head. It becomes more of like a pecking order. It becomes more of like crabs in a bucket. Yes. An open wine. It's like... Especially the worst is when it's like there's three people in the audience and all the comic is doing is paying attention to what the comics are laughing at and you're just doing a set for the comics in the back. Yeah. You're making jokes specifically about the scene and shit. The audience doesn't know what the fuck is going on, but you're like, there's more comics, so fuck these people. Like, they know what I'm talking about. And it's like, what are you doing? You're stabbing yourself in the foot. We just have too much respect for like our families, which carries over into too much respect for others. So you think about this. You have an open mic, and the best way to get bumped would to be to be seen on like a weekend at Yuck Yucks by the people that are doing the show, right? Because if they're like, oh, fuck, a boss did a weekend. He could probably do the first spot at this open mic. Why should he wait 30 comics to do that? Yeah, bumped is when you just show up to an open mic, essentially, Instead and of get up right hours. away because there's usually a long list. But the higher level people, they just stick around for a couple of sets, yeah, and they, they get their set, and they dip. So if you think about this like a business, if I get up faster, if I'm seen at Yuck Yucks, then you go, how do I get up there at Yuck Yucks? You just got to ask a couple people, and eventually you get there. So what's less or more work? Going there, bombing. You've seen tons of comedians not get better after years, right? So what's less work? Work on the people at Yuck Yucks, get me on the weekend, then bump me around town. Or slog it out because the majority of us are going here and waiting for, for the be- short term. Play the Yuck Yucks game. For the long term, slog it out, I think. Well, you got to do both, but the strategy's got to be focused on. I don't have to do what everyone's doing, and everybody that does that mentality, we always idolize them. We're like, "Fuck, you're so successful." It's like, "How did you?" It's like, "Yeah, I realized that that one way wasn't going to work for me. That way you happen to be doing." There is there is no uh, there is no focus on finding the thing for you. Everyone yeah. just almost talks about comedy as if there's a Ten Commandments. Thou shalt go out every night. Thou shalt route for one hour a day. Thou shalt create a podcast. Thou shalt, as if there's like a rigid set of things you must do to be successful. Whereas like you said, there's no focus. It's like, yo, I realize that if I go out, if I go out three nights a week and focus on writing the other nights, I know I only got three nights and someone can actually develop faster than that. But for me with an addictive personality, Loving the stand up, I want to get it every day. You know what I mean? That's why I took the break off weed because I'm and hookah and shit like that. Because if I like it, I do it every day. I do it. I have an addictive personality. Well, I think it's an addictive personality, but it's also the acknowledgement that you're like, ooh, I can get good faster if I go more. But it's on. Unde- it's on. Un- uh, it's undebatable. But now I and now I realize with COVID, like I said, you are kidding yourself. You are wasting away your life. You can still have a life and it will only feed your comedy and it will only yeah, uh, advise your comedy of to course. a higher level if you take those nights to not go out yeah. and take those nights to spend time with your girl, your friends, go home, do something that is not comedy related. Your hel- It's like you said, you're resting for next week. Whereas I was like, even if I was like, okay, tonight I'm not going out. By the time six o'clock came out, I'd be like, oh, okay, what am I thinking? You know what I mean? What am I thinking? I think all of us at our level, the guys that were like trying to basically see like, hey, do I write every day and try to go up with a new thing? Like, what do I do here? I think guys like us were like, you know what? Maybe when it comes back, I use the slots for different things. You know, like, okay, tonight I'm doing this joke. Tonight I want to see why this works, why this doesn't work. I want to get four shows in and I want to do it the same way, the same beat. I want to set it up the same way and really fucking see why it works. And the reason I'm saying that is because how many jokes do you have that you're like, this motherfucking thing just doesn't work and you just never or, do a deep dive. Or into the opposite. Like, you're yeah. like, this fucking thing just works. Yeah. I can go to this in my in my worst spot and it works. So it's like, you obviously fucking did that in the open mic where you have this thing just, I don't know, you could just pull it out anytime and you can, it's like a guy with a knife. Yeah, yeah, it's a butterfly it. knife, like in Beat It music video. Yeah, he doesn't even look. Yeah. He just has it. So it's like, that's what the mics are. And I'm not even saying that like a new idea. You read on comedy. I've been doing that, yeah. Never get on stage without a goal. That's how you do it. But it's easy when, you know, it doesn't feel like Toronto's the, the place to do it. It doesn't seem like there's a lot happening. The people that are getting up seem to be PC, don't seem to work as hard, and aren't really that funny on stage. It's all discouraging. Because okay. crabs in the bucket mentality was actually the detriment to the fucking people that seem to be out now was like, well, we were actually just getting fucking lost in the crowd because you had hundreds of people out doing comedy. 
So now it's like, well, that's who actually wanted to be there. Yeah, you're a good point. The, the person who you still see on shows now, there's been such a mass exodus from the comedy scene. Yeah. And this is probably across the board. And I, New York is no exception. L.A. is definitely no exception. L.A.'s probably had like a tw- probably 20 to 30 percent of their artist population, lower level artist population, has pretty much been like, see ya. You know what, though? Forbes came out with an article that there was like 386,000 people that left and 555,000 that went in. Oh, that went in. Yeah. Okay, but those are opportunistic people, though, that went in. I don't know if yeah, they're necessarily not all artistic. Artistic, right? They're like, oh, this is my chance to go to L.A. for like uh, all these people are leaving. It's going to affect rental prices. I may have a, a little bit of an edge. Well, for the get first it. time in a market sense, there's a lot of buyers market. Like, Yeah, people have leverage from uh, being a leasee, you know what I mean? Like Where- a Best Buy right now. Best Buy's got like Black Friday sales. So you're thinking to yourself, well, that's kind of early. And it is a little early. When is Black Friday normally? Like November 21st or something? Something like that. But they usually run up to the Black Friday shit with like not much sales. But yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been yeah. in sales. To make a vacuum. Yeah. Yeah. But now it's like, well, there's going to be less new products because they know that the dollar has to be reserved for some other things. You can't all get the new iPhone. So we got to get rid of this shit because- They're doing a purge. You're not going to come back to buy the, the new thing that's- Half as new as it would have been pre-COVID. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like the, the iPhone 12 is really just a half step up. I'm not saying the other iPhones aren't anybody that's a fucking nut job about it. But it's just a half step up. But now that every product's a half step up, like why is KitchenAid going to make a two times better stand mixer when your income didn't change because the company <laughs> can't pay you anymore this yeah. year? <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. like that whole thing is just shot. So now they're like, hey, please buy. Please buy. Oh, so that's why they have sales right up until the point of the big Fuck. sale. Everyone's getting Bro, everything. it's like uh, car lots. They're moving their 2019s and 2020s. Like, Because at one point, car lots, the cars get to a point where if they stay long enough, they begin costing the money. There's a depreciation. There's a lot fee every day that's pretty much so uh, taken against the value of the car. Like It's going into your bottom line. So they essentially have to start having crazy spiffs and incentives to move. It's got 0% APR. We'll fucking give you 2,500 off. Anything. Just make room for our 2021s. We got no room for this. You know, we have a finite amount of space here. It's happening in everything. A friend of mine just bought a condo. She was talking about how you're like, you're trying to get it in a good interest rate, right? Get stuff lower. Hopefully the market swings up. You start to think about it. Like if I buy a condo for half a million dollars and I try to put say 25% or whatever, it's a little over 125 grand. And I got to pay the mortgage. Say in four years, it's worth six hundred grand, and I sell it. The bank is then I got you know they're gonna give me six hundred thousand. I'll pay the mortgage back to the bank, and I'll take some of the money. Where does that money come from? The person who's buying my house just pays the deposit again, maybe a smaller deposit depending on the interest rate they're trying to lock in for the house. So then you start to think like, the reason COVID is fucking everybody up is because a lot of businesses are built on. Nothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, especially the financial industry. It is just a movement of numbers. You know what I mean? There is no backing of currency at all. It's just like, yo, on paper, we're going to give you this. We're such a big corporation. We're going to lend you 500000 right? And then you put some money toward it so it's not a big risk. And then you pay into that. And then they come and pay through a mortgage of their own. So it's mortgages, closing out mortgages. We give you the net. There's been inflation. It's worth a little less. It's literally just like, that's why the whole uh, mortgage crisis happened in 2008. Yeah. Everything was getting backed with nothing. Yeah. And then people were betting on the defaults. It was like such an inflated system on nothing, right? Well, that's why when you go to buy a house, they're like, no, no, we have to see the, the money in the account here. Yeah, we, it has to be in the account for yeah. one year. Yeah. We have to know it is, you are secure, like you are uh, employed fully. There, You know what I mean? Well, because the bank can lend out 10 times the money. So if they have $1, they can lend you 10 bucks. So it's like, you start to think about that. Where Banks shouldn't have fucking assets. How does a bank have assets? It's, it's meant to ha- help me keep my money. But that one they use, that one they take from you, they put that into assets that grow, right? So the deposit, that's the real the, money that you the paid, whole. the real money that you paid, you saved 100000 and they gave you 500000 But the only thing that's real is your contribution. Yeah, exactly. That's it. 
the one so in that the time that they have that that you're paying back interest at three percent or whatever it is they got to make as much money of as possible off that so i don't know if that all gets hedged together for a hedge fund or if they use it and they have a real estate uh fund they used to invest in tangible assets that are appreciating i don't know how well what the bank's it, model is as far as like growing the vast majority of their uh liquid assets a lot of it with the consumers is like based in in life insurance, auto insurance, home insurance, and then the types of accounts that you have. So they're trying to get you into certain life policies, life insurance policies, where they're collecting a huge percentage and they're giving you a smaller A tiny percentage. percentage. And they have a lot of accounts where they're like, have minimum this amount locked in. Always. They won't, they need you to have liquidity locked in. Because that's so their jump that, off. That is how their business operates. Yes. They need as many people to give us real money. <laughs> right? Because the only real money is what's coming in from the actual people. The pennies, the stuff. Yo, you must keep 5000 in it minimum and it's free. We don't pay anything for the account. But you must maintain 5000 in it. And they take that 5000 they accumulate it to all these people. We got to make money off of this quick. In the meantime, we'll lend people money we don't have. Because they, they, they've they never fucked anybody over. So we give them a decent rate. They'll pay us back slowly but surely. You can't even have two. It's a juggling act. You it is even, a legal juggling act. You can't even have too low of like a debt to income ratio. Like you can't take on a house that would be more than what you'd make. But the reverse is not true for a billionaire. Like a billionaire could have way more debt leveraged against his assets than say you could. Because he's validated. Because once you get into the millions plus, you're validated it's as like a, a, club. a value earner. You know yeah. what I mean? Like this this guy can fucking generate. You could literally be a hundred million and <laughs> be part of like some ridiculous like buyout that's like in the billions. You know what I mean? They say once they make uh, Drake says it. Once you make your first million dollars, it's like you, you just, you're having different conversations. You're, you're in get, different yeah, rooms. You're in different rooms. Yeah, you're getting millions all the time. It'd be cool to have that type of financial flexibility to earn a million dollars. And the only way I think a regular person could do it is to try to leverage real estate. Marry rich, baby. <sighs> yeah, but that's easier there. said than done. Get I'm in, in some real estate hottie. too. It's... I'm trying to buy a house. Yeah, It's not all as, e as easy as people say, but might be 900 if years you were going to live in it for a couple of years, it's always a, like a good move. What, but a lot, Whatever it is, the piece of real estate that you acquire. If you live in it, it's awesome. Like from a tax point of view, from a security point of view, it just makes it's a utilized space by you. When it is a rental property, then now you have to manage it. You, yeah. you have to manage it to make sure that there's a positive cash flow. If it's a negative cash flow, you have to try to minimize that. Uh, are you going to get a management company to, to manage it all for you and you give them a cut? Like it becomes a headache all for the sake of making money, growing your money, right? It's also maddening how like how much shit piles on. You're like, oh, I got this one car or I got this one camera. Maybe the next one and the next one. I don't, you forget how programmed you are and then you just look back. You're like, I don't actually need anything. Like I just need a couple things. I need a couple mics, this fucking box or whatever camera. And you're like, that's kind of it. That's it. Where people get in trouble is like, I was selling windows and doors. You go into these crazy houses and you're like, there's only two of you, you guys only have kids and there's like four floors here. Yeah. It's insane. I never get that. And it's like, like mansions. Yeah, man. It's cool. Like where it's just wings. There's wings to the house. Yes. And there's like the nanny. He's got a nanny for the left wing and a nanny for the right wing. It's cool. Like you're like, this is cool. But at the end of the fucking day, you're in a room doing whatever the thing you like is. So whether you have 10 of those yeah, or got, fucking two. You can only utilize one at, at a time. time. Yeah. So it's like, what the fuck? But you, that's again. They'll be like, "Let's get a pr so, let's get a home that reflects our status in uh, society relative to our uh, our affluence level. Something that's a good buy, you know, so we can make a profit when we sell it, and we can bear to get something more expensive. Like you know what I mean? Like we can get a one point five million dollar place that's projected to be one point eight million in three years, or we can get a five hundred thousand dollar spot. That's projected to be six hundred thousand in three years, and and it's totally with houses. Why not get the one point five? We can afford it. It's at the level of our friends. I'd we'd rather be in that one. That's like the poison mindset, right? Is to upgrade your lifestyle proportionate to what you make, and that is the trap. 
you keep as you get the raids you upgrade you upgrade you yeah. upgrade the key is literally to just live Downgrade. below your means yes. and then and it's just it. gravy after that and you don't even have to save it all that pay for experiences rather than having that left wing go to portugal for a week and spain for a week and bulgaria for a week you don't pay pay for ex travels the only like way to spend your money where there's never regrets you would not believe how cultural like when i saw windows and doors yeah so our gta has got a lot of different cultures you go up to like an asian a korean like korean how i think it's more like japanese people do this or more chinese people do this both of them separately do it the house is big the car is nice there's fucking nothing in the house it's, it's all like exterior it's the show it's all about looking like yeah we fucking ball but you're like you guys don't there's nothing in your house it's a table there's no beds in the rooms and oh they, there's a bunch of empty rooms yeah straight up <laughs> oh you're talking about big houses yeah and then you go to like uh, an east indian guy's house yeah his house is smaller yeah there's a lot of people living in it yeah yeah and there's fucking rugs everywhere yes and there's like food everywhere and, and then you go to like a black dude's house and there's like one room that's sick as shit. He's like, this is the room where most of the shit happens. <laughs> and then every other house in the room is like, yeah, I probably I don't really use this shit. And then you go to a white lady's house and her house is like as nice as it is on the outside. As it is on the inside. As it is on the inside or complete trash. Like it's one or the other. So either <laughs> you have money and you figured it out or you don't and you're fucked. <laughs> and everybody does this so like it's so funny you, so you were constantly judging people from the exterior being like what am i going to see on the inside well that's your job you go like okay if you have an audi and a beamer and i'm going to sell you windows there's a likelihood that i'm going to make a bit more money on you than say somebody who's like got three wheels on a hyundai fucking sonata yeah okay so it's like i'm trying to evaluate you based on that and the curveball is most of the time it doesn't really add up yeah exactly those that audi and bmw are on leases yeah you know what I mean? And you're over you're already over on the mileage. You know what I mean? You're already eating into every, you can afford less windows whereas those guys they position themselves financially a lot better. They're living slightly below their means. They kept that car cuz it's still running. Why get a new one? It's still running. And you even realize as a salesperson how the perception fucks with you. Cuz I was dealing with a guy who's like trying to haggle me on the price of a patio door and like, we're dog, you got a Lambo. <laughs> we're literally sitting in like a $2 million house and he's like, oh, we don't have that much money. He literally said that. I was like, how can you say that about when we're sitting in this house? And I said that to him. And you realize like- You can't is, judge. It isn't yeah. what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like if you get, if you bought a house, but it takes you fucking 90 hours a week just to have the lights be barely on. But when I drive by, I'm like, man, a boss is they're doing killing good. it. They're doing, they're killing it. You're like- well, what the fuck is worth it? Image is a crazy motivator, man. Like I've said it a million times on this podcast. I had my old BMW. I was paying so much for it a month. I was over on the miles that were allotted to me because it was a lease. So now I couldn't drive it because I'm way over and I'm broke to do anything because of the payment. So I'm sitting there with a, like a fucking retard outside the BMWs there so I look like I'm doing well and I'm trapped in this lifestyle yeah. trapped and a lot of people are in that situation and that's pretty much what I pulled the plug on that's how I felt about COVID when we were doing our shit it's like I have goals and I, I do think that this is going to help me but I also feel trapped in a lot of it like I'm always here and I'm always seeing this result in very small changes whereas outside of COVID I've changed my life vastly more in these last eight months same here like I've, you've probably doubled productivity everything just yeah, yeah. you have to COVID was the time where things stop and you have to be honest with yourself and you have to ask yourself the real questions I think yeah you know it's like oh okay so I cannot do stand up I quit engineering in this big like let's go comedy hurrah yeah what the fuck now exactly what the fuck now all you need is money in your pocket and like the ability to fucking put out shit. That's beautiful, brother. Yo, let's land this podcast, man. Land it. What are you saying? Tell the people how to find you, man. Just my name. Do you wanna? I don't know what to do with my Instagram. I'm just kind of like a meandering through this artistry. Yeah. I wanna make yeah. sick videos, man. I, I just wanna make cinematic stuff. And, and yo, grab a pick right now. Grab a pick just like this. Can grab one. Yeah. Okay, there you go. The man's got a Sony just like that. As always, I'm going to put the guy's info in the description, so check him out. You're going to go to his Instagram page. It's going to be photography, fucking 
stand up oh, and a mixture windows and doors probably a mixture of god knows what but check him out my boy jordan palachicchio making his uh third time here on the podcast or even fourth i don't even know uh but yo from my end as always tell your friends about the immigrant section that's all i ask tell at least one of your friends uh about this podcast if you fuck with it and can sell them on it and tell them to grow it why not you know how does this look it's sick Cameras proper are sick, dude. fuck yeah but yeah once again thank you for coming out peace, peace. you did it